and somehow it manages to come across as less obnoxious and vindictive than other components of the message. <gasps> Make sure you like and subscribe and go follow me on my Twitch and my other YouTube channel. Those links are down below. Also, my Patreon, where I post more content on there that I don't post here. And I want a pet animal that's half chinchilla and half mink, because it'd be really soft, and I could call it chink, and that's okay. Today, I'm going to be reacting to Critical Drinker, Aquaman, and the Lost Kingdom. Movies, much like people, sometimes have the rotten luck of coming along at precisely the wrong time in history, failing spectacularly where they might otherwise have flourished if they'd been a little bit more lucky with their timing. The first Aquaman movie was a perfect example of the inverse, releasing just when superhero mania was at its peak and somehow raking in over a billion dollars, despite being so thoroughly pointless and forgettable that I genuinely Ooh. struggle to even remember what happened in it. Ooh. But the times, they are becoming quite different, which brings me along to Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, the latest movie of the long financial suicide note that is DC on film for the past couple of years, and the final dregs oh, wow. of the once mighty DCU, a film that everyone with a shred of common sense predicted rightly would flop, co-starring one of the least popular actresses in Hollywood, released at the tail end of the worst year for superhero movies since Superman 4, and the sad Hi, final dribble kid. of an aborted franchise that's now in the middle of a largely futile reboot. In short, it's it's flopping for entirely predictable reasons, most of which have got nothing to do with the quality of the film itself. And that's a bit of a shame when I think about it, because as much as it surprises me to say this, Aquaman 2 is not as bad as you might think. Are you serious? I mean, it's not exactly good either, but at least it didn't make me despise the very concept of filmmaking like so much of the other garbage that's come out this year. The movie's set several years after the events of the first film. Aquaman is now the king of Atlantis after overthrowing his evil brother Orm, but he soon finds the business of being king pretty tedious and tiresome, especially as constant clashes with the High Council who pretty much block every decision he tries to make. Which is funny because they totally didn't exist in the previous movie, but oh well. His only source of enjoyment is his private life with his wife and son, and he soon becomes a doting father figure. But trouble is afoot in the shape of Black Manta, who's back to take revenge for the death of his father in the first film. His search for new weapons to fight Aquaman soon leads him to Antarctica, where he uncovers an ancient weapon buried beneath the ice. But I'm so sorry to interrupt right there, but I actually um, kind of already need to talk about it, because I haven't seen the first movie, and he's doing a really good job at kind of filling you in without going into the detail yet, so it's kind of like the intro for me. Kind of an oversight to have a high council, I think is what he called it, that wasn't really relevant or even appeared at all, or I guess wasn't even mentioned in the first movie, and then just have them such an obstacle in the second movie, because it sounds like they're kind of a staple of, hey, they represent something that's kind of always been here, like Congress or some type of government, yet they weren't in the first movie. So whenever he made decisions in the first movie, that kind of already leads me to question, did he not have to answer to anybody or get get permission first? Does that mean the person who was in charge in the first movie did have to get permission? And maybe we just didn't see that because it was like behind the scenes and he wasn't in charge. Almost like Thor. Maybe we didn't see all of the godlike king type things because he wasn't actually really in charge or the leader in the first movie, so we saw a lot of earthly struggles because he wasn't treated like a god yet. He uncovers an ancient weapon buried beneath the ice, but that's not the only thing lurking down there, and soon he's possessed by an evil spirit that also wants to take revenge on Atlantis, making him stronger and more powerful and more dangerous than ever before. His first cool. attack causes massive damage to the city, as well as putting Mira out of action. Oh no, how terrible, that's just... That's just awful! How terrible! Oh no! But it's just the beginning of a much bigger plan to destroy the world's oceans and free an entire army of demons imprisoned deep within the ice of Antarctica. With the fate of the world now hanging in the balance, Aquaman's forced to turn to the one man with the knowledge he needs to save it. You know, providing anything even resembling a fresh perspective on Aquaman 2 is going to be a tough one, because basically everything I said about Shazam 2, Blue Beetle, and Black Adam holds true here just as it did for them. It's a moderately entertaining, comprehensively mid-superhero film with some decent character beats, a charmingly old-fashioned central theme of family and fatherhood that does nothing especially ambitious or different, and probably would have made a decent profit if it had come out 10 or even 5 years ago. If this film was a meal, it would 
would be a cheese sandwich with a glass of water. The kind of blandly inoffensive food that nobody's ever going to get excited about eating, but it's unlikely to offend anyone either. Except maybe vegans, but I'll take dietary advice from them on the same day I take likability advice from Rachel Zegler. Oh, the point I'm trying well. to make here is that Aquaman 2's biggest shortcoming is probably its own lack of ambition and self-confidence. It's a film mm -hmm. so afraid of doing something wrong that it doesn't do much of anything at all beyond the most basic, tried and tested story beats that have been done a million times before. Our main character faces an existential threat and has to team up with a former enemy to overcome it. He begins as a reluctant hero who shirks responsibility but slowly matures into his new leadership role. And along the way, the two men learn to work together and respect each other, ultimately putting aside their differences for the good of their own people. And I don't know man, you'd think with nothing left to lose, they would have gone for broke here and tried something really crazy and outside the box. The first Aquaman was a good time to play it safe as a franchise. This is not. Like I said before, there's a core theme of fatherhood, family unity, and learning to forgive and atone for past mistakes that doesn't exactly rock the world of right into its core, but also doesn't feel like some preachy postmodernist struggle session either. And fuck me, it's a nice change to see fathers depicted in a positive light in a mainstream Hollywood movie for once. You can definitely tell this one wasn't made by Disney. The only hot topic issue that the movie really tries to address is environmentalism and global warming. The villain's plot involves burning fossil fuels to raise the ocean temperature and melt the that ice caps sense. to release the evil demon army and yes the implementation is just as clunky and on the nose as it sounds but again ideas like this have been in movies for decades now and somehow it manages to come across as less obnoxious and vindictive than other components of the message well of course what else are they going to do not arguing with critical drinker or pointing out that i agree with it because on one side you could argue well yeah, that's bland, boring, but on the other side, no, in a serious way, what else are they going to do? I mean, it's a movie that takes place underwater, and you're trying to think of someone evil. You would think about something that would affect all of them as a race, species, whatever. Um, yeah, it would have to affect the water, and it's just such an easy duh to go with heating water temperatures, you know? And what would cause that? Like, it's just, it, you could see how, just, oh, well, duh. Yes, again. Um, but then back to the other topic, which would be, okay, but it, it just feels pushed now. Like, maybe we've seen it too many times pushed or forced or squeezed into places to where not only does it feel pushed, but in here, because it would be so obvious that you would go for that and actually fit fine, it makes sense. It feels lazy and expected. So be more creative. Message. The cast are mostly adequate in their roles. Patrick Wilson's always been a favourite of mine, and although he's better than stuff like this, he at least gets to have a bit of fun this time around, and his chemistry with Jason Momoa is good. Speaking of which, Momoa does what he does best in this film, playing Jason Momoa. He's got the same kind of laid-back charisma that he brings to pretty much every role, but I don't know, man. His heart doesn't really seem to be in this one, either because of the endless reshoots or the simple knowledge that this movie was fucked from the beginning. But the reshoots? thing everyone's probably wondering about is, how much of Amber Heard is in this movie? Well, probably more than you wanted, but less than you might have expected. You can very much tell where the reshoots kicked in because she gets ejected from the movie around the 30 minute mark and doesn't show up again at all until the finale, and even then she barely speaks more than a handful of lines. They've definitely cut her role down to the bare minimum without having to make a whole new movie, and although I don't imagine many people will be happy to see her at all, the plus side is that she doesn't really have much of a presence in the story. Ultimately, Aquaman 2 puts me in a weird place as a critic, because although it's not a terrible film on its own merits, I can't think of any real reasons to recommend it to people. It's a film that goes nowhere, does nothing new or different, Ooh. doesn't really engage or challenge the audience, and doesn't provide enough stakes or gravitas to keep you invested in what's happening. In short, it's a thoroughly mid-superhero movie. I mean, I don't know, maybe if you're really bored or lonely over the holidays, it's a way to kill a couple of hours, I guess, but otherwise it's just another forgettable superhero film in a year completely filled with them. And given the complete apathy towards it so far, it seems destined to sink beneath the waves with barely a ripple. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now. The Amber Heard thing, I almost even kind of forgot because the whole forgettable and irrelevant thing, which was kind of already being pushed as the topic without even bringing her up. So yeah, I actually kind of forgot that she would probably be a major thing in this of 
Look, wait, how, wait, what happened to her? Was she in it? How much was she in it? I mean, from my understanding, she's like a main character, no? I mean, at least like the second, third. She's a pretty relevant character. And if it was on the first movie and they were halfway done shooting, they might even pull what they did with Snow White where they just thought, hmm, we're just going to wait a year and postpone it because we can put the first movie out of this at any time, whereas it's the second. And so if you're basically already done filming and you owe everybody all of this money, um, reshooting her role isn't going to help. She already played it in the first movie. You can't change the actress and reshoot half the movie. The first movie's already out. We already saw her. We already know. So it would just kind of be weird, especially if they tried to pull that she died at the beginning of the movie. It would just change too much of the story. Then you're going to make the movie even worse, and people aren't going to make their money back. So um, on one hand, yes, it's understandable to cut as much as they did and have to do so many reshoots and put so much more money and time into doing it, which probably brought down the movie's maybe ability to be as good as it could have been a little bit. But not to take her completely out because that would be almost way too affecting to too many people. Um, you could probably only postpone for so long and that would probably cause a lot of people to, uh, you know, struggle. They're all trying to get paid for something that was almost done. Yeah, I enjoyed this uh, critical jerky reaction. It almost feels like it's been a minute, but I'm not actually sure. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Let me know down in the comments below what you think. and. Yeah, check out all my links, including my Twitch, my Patreon, and I'll see you all next time. I, I may be blue.